Okie dokie, this will be a continuation of Hebrews, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, and I have here on the screen the Bible Analyzer 5.4, and this is the King James Bible, or the Common Man's Reference Bible, the King James the ASV, <laughs> and a parallel between these two. And uh, so this is, uh, you can find this online, and it makes it pretty easy, pretty quick, how we can go through some things. Now, eight is a number for new beginning, and uh, the subtitle is A Better Ministry. So possibly this will be a new beginning for some to approach the Bible differently and to look at it doctrinally. Okay, that's the goal here on this one. Uh, now, we've had seven chapters, and I've said from the start, this is the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews, and I firmly believe that. It's written to the Hebrews, uh, and in chapter 1, verse 2, they happen to be living during a time period called the last days. You see, the writers of the scriptures are not limited by time as the author of the scriptures, is outside of time. And so we need to keep that in mind. And a person might say, well, the titles of the epistles are not inspired. Well, I'm not so sure of that. And I believe it's written to the Hebrews. And chapter 8 will be uh, a uh, make it or break it situation. It will be the uh, obvious determining fact to, to verify the fact that this letter is written to the Hebrews of the last days. So we've gone through seven chapters and he starts off now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So this is the summary of the previous seven chapters. So I know pastors, uh, Arminian pastors in particular, will use Hebrews 6, uh, 4 through 6, right here, to hold their people in bondage, saying that they can lose their salvation. Okay, so they will do that. Now, the Baptist guys, they are going to mention uh, this tithing, this tenth, this tithing, that we find in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, because uh, they and themselves uh, get a personal benefit to keep promoting the idea of tithing, uh, especially storehouse tithing, to their local church. And uh, then a lot of them will uh, use Hebrews 10, 25, to make sure, uh, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, uh, make sure someone's uh, butt is sitting on the pew, or, uh, sorry, their, their, their bum uh, is sitting there in the pew, uh, making sure that they have an offering in their hand so that their uh, ministry can be propelled further, you know, for uh, so forth and so on. Okay, but uh, Hebrews 8 uh, it's going to be a, um, a, a humdinger, as they say. Uh, Hebrews 8 will reveal uh, the truth of the Jewish doctrine of this letter and the error, the error of uh, dishonest handling of the Word of God. Hmm, yeah, the error. Okay, where do we find this error? We got to go to 2 Corinthians 4. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, one more time. There we go. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Uh, Hebrews, uh, that's, written, that's written to the church. It's written to the church. Yes, that's written to the church. Uh, uh, Jewish Christians, that's, yes, it's Jewish Christians, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Yes, uh, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, uh, you know, keeping your people in bondage. If they don't obey your rules and regulations, they're not, they're not saved. Yes, sorry. No, you're deceitful because that passage says if they lose it, they can't get it back, whoever it is. 
but my but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Okay, so we're going to appeal to your conscience in Hebrews chapter eight. There are two kinds of people that read the Bible. Uh, which one are you? Okay, two kinds of people read the Bible, uh, those who want the truth, allowing the scripture to speak for itself, to whom it's spoken, you know, and they change their beliefs to match the Bible, and then those who want validation, seeking to justify what they already believe. So Hebrews 8 is going to reveal what kind of a person uh, is going to read Hebrews 8. Now, the things we have spoken, this is the sum. So there's the footnote that I have in the reference Bible. And it reads, the summary of the preceding chapters reveals that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, is a better high priest. Okay, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we got all those cross-references. He's the right-hand man of God. He's in the throne of the majesty in heavens. There's the real throne, according to Ezekiel 10, verse 1. That throne is right above a firmament, something very firm, and it has a door. And it has windows in it. So that throne is right above uh, the firmament in the heavens. Third heaven, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. So the summary of the preceding chapter reveals the Lord Jesus is a better high priest over a better tabernacle that is in heaven. Who has a tabernacle in the Bible? Okay, who has a tabernacle? The sacraments and sacrifices of human priests will not suffice for eternal salvation. Eternal salvation stems from an eternal Savior. Okay, let's go back and read this and uh, enjoy uh, the Word of God. So we, who? Hebrews, right up there. Hebrews, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens the third heaven in particular. Okay, according to Ezekiel 10, verse 1, right above the firmament is a throne, a minister of the sanctuary. Okay, so you have sanctuary here, you have tabernacle here. Okay, so sanctuary and the true tabernacle. The true tabernacle. What is the true tabernacle? Tabernacle. Let's go to 9 verse 23 of Hebrews that we use there. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. So there's a one up in heaven of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay, and then I have a cross-reference, 9-11. But Christ be, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And then I have a footnote there. Uh, and so we got all those footnotes, but I think I'm going to reserve that uh, for chapter 9. And so we'll go back to chapter 8. A minister, a minister of the sanctuary. Okay, you can see sanctuary would be a root uh, word of sanctification. So here's the very first time the word sanctuary is found in the Bible, okay? And it's the only time with an uppercase S. And so we can see that this is dealing with who? The Hebrews, Israel. Yes, we run the word Hebrew. Let's see what we come up with. And, oh, Hebrew, Abram. 
Okay, so we have Abram who became Abraham. This is Joseph. Uh, this is Joseph. This is Joseph. This is the Hebrew midwives. Okay, the Hebrew midwives. Okay, while they were in Egypt, and oh, them Hebrew midwives, they didn't. They didn't obey the government. Oh man, they didn't do that. I'm not a Hebrew midwives. And so then you can come down through here. You got he, Jeremiah 34, 9. This is instrumental. This is vital, important to know. Being an Hebrew or an Hebrew S, the female, go free that none should serve himself of them to wit of a Jew. Oh, here we have a Hebrew is uh, connected to a Jew. So, yeah. And then Jonah called himself a Hebrew. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he spoke in a Hebrew tongue. Okay, and he heard Jesus speak in a Hebrew tongue when Jesus witnessed to him. And then here we have Philippians 3, 5. Paul said he's a Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin, of the stock of Israel. So we have Paul, who is a Hebrew, and he calls himself a Jew. Let's see if it's right here. He speaks in the Hebrew tongue. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus. So we have Hebrew, Jew, and Israelite. Yeah, all together here. Ooh, boy. So that, that's what the epistle of Hebrews is written to. Okay, then in, in Revelation chapter 15, we discover that uh, in verse 5, and after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Okay, so you have a tabernacle is like a tent structure where the Israelites, uh, you know, walked around, uh, wandered around the wilderness, and then God would, the pillar of uh, fire or the pillar of cloud would stop, and then they would uh, set up that circus tent, that tabernacle. What did it look like? What did that tabernacle look like? And then Solomon made that, um, you know, temporary tabernacle, that tabernacle that could be transported to a temple, a more permanent structure location, okay? And But yet in the Bible, they're used uh, interchangeably in a couple of places. You have in Ezekiel chapter 41, where it will go back and forth. That's 42. Yep, 41. After when he brought me to the temple, measured the post to six cubits, brought on one side six cubits, brought on the other side, which was a breath, breath, the, the breath of the tabernacle. That, that, that makes me really wonder that word, that breath, that width. Okay, what did that tabernacle look like? Now, I'm, most everybody tends to think that that tabernacle was a rectangle, but uh, the Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And I'm not so certain uh, now that it was a rectangle. I'm just not quite certain of that. Uh, here in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 10 is where David uh, advised Solomon and it says, Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. So that sanctuary would be the innermost part of the tabernacle or the temple. And so try, just trying to, you know, kind of figure this out if we possibly can. Now this here fella... Uh, has a theory that the tabernacle that they walk carried around was a circular structure uh, like a yurt. You know, a yurt is what this looks like. It's a circular structure, and then it's, you stretch the tent over it, or as it says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, the Lord stretched the heavens over a circle. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not certain, you know, of this. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm getting persuaded, but I'm not 
absolute uh, sure of it. Now we could uh, look at things in life where we have planetarium. Okay, this plant, look at that plant, P-L-A-N-E, plane. What is a planetarium? They show stars in the top of this, but it's a circular thing with a dome over it. Now this is the Chicago uh, planetarium, and here is a another viewpoint of it. So could it be, and I'm just thinking maybe uh, Solomon's temple had the outer court, which it does say, and then a circular, could this have been the sanctuary? And this actually is a picture of uh, the earth. This is what it looks like on the inside, circular, and they see the stars up in heaven. But again, notice P-L-A-N-E, plane planet, but it's the first five is plane. Is that a possibility? Is uh, Andrew uh, Hoyle, Hoy, Hoy, is he, is he correct in his theory? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure about it, but uh, the Indians sure understood what a circular um, tent, how the benefits of it, living in the cold, they obviously learned about it, and in Mongolia, they have the yurts over there, you know, circular yurts. So uh, it's just something that I'm, uh, you know, I haven't taken a, a good amount of time to uh, look at this theory here, but I'm willing. I'm willing. Are you willing, my friend? Are you willing? You say it's not that important. Well, okay, whatever. It may or may not be, uh, but I don't know if it's in the Bible. I think it's important. I, yeah, I think it's important if it's in the Bible. But in Hebrews 8, to a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Okay, the Lord pitched. You, you pitch a tent, don't you? Don't you pitch a tent? You pitch a tabernacle. That's what, uh, you know, carnies do in uh, the county fairs. They often pitch these tents. You know, maybe traveling circuses, you know, Barnum and Bailey Circus, and they traveled around and that thing. And so what happened? Uh, this true tabernacle here, this uh, true tabernacle mentioned over there, Lord pitched one in heaven, and then and then he told uh, Moses, hey, I, want, I need you to pitch one like the one I'm showing you. And this, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. So those high priests are from the Levites, okay, but Jesus, the great high priest, was from Judah after the order of Melchizedek. And it says, wherefore, it is of necessity that this man, this man, this high priest, uh, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, okay, because why? It's Levi, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, the what, the Mosaic law, the Levitical law, Okay, do you see why this is written to the Hebrews? How can you say that this is written to Jewish Christians? You're not being honest, my friend. If you're looking at this doctrine, and this is who serve unto the example and shadow, shadow of heavenly things. So this this is a, where it mentions a shadow of things to come. That's written, that, that Colossians 2 is written to the church. But he's writing about things to come, a shadow of things to come. Let's take a let's take a gander at that Colossians two, and here let no man therefore judge you in meat, you born again Christians, and meat meat offerings, in drink drink offerings, respect of a holy day, you know, new moons, new moons, okay, or in, in, of Sabbath days. That's the only time Paul mentions that to the church. These Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. That's in the future. That's in the millennium. But the bodies of Christ, we're different. We're setting on something different. Wow, boy, see how handy this thing is here? Uh, shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, 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 saith he that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee to thee in the mount. That's Mount Sinai. It's in Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's take let's run let's take a look at these uh, two at least two. The Exodus twenty five forty. Okay, in Exodus twenty five forty, this is uh, 
the Lord, God, uh, showing Moses the uh, first national leader for Israel. And he was going to show him how to make this uh, tabernacle and all the furniture and everything. And he said, here, look, that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. So he showed him the tabernacle. I wrote in a footnote, the tabernacle was made according to the pattern of the universe. Uh, maybe universe is not the right word, but the heavens and the earth. Wow, isn't that something? Was showed thee in the holy mount. Okay, the other cross reference is in Acts 7.44. This is the uh, message that uh, Stephen uh, delivered to the Jews. Uh, this is kind of the, oh boy, this is the deal breaker for them, uh, where those Jews rejected this message. But here uh, it says that uh, the Lord showed uh, Moses, okay, where he says, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses. Okay, he showed this unto Moses, and I got the you know, cross reference over there, Hebrews 8, 5. See that? That he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So Paul uh, is showing the account in Hebrews that Moses actually witnessed the tabernacle, the true tabernacle in heaven, and then Stephen uh, is given uh, the Jews their, oh man, a deal breaker in Acts 7, and some unfortunately broke uh, the deal, and uh, you know, oh, that's how it goes, but hey, praise the Lord, we Gentiles get in the show now, and uh, so see, saith he, that uh, thou make all things according to the pattern, showed thee in the mount, Mount, mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Okay, but now, but now hath he or obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator. And that more is going to be said about that mediator in chapter 9. So you got that. Plus Jesus is the one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, of a better covenant, covenant, better custom, covenant, which was established upon better, better promises. That's a... Two of 13 times it's found in the Bible, better promises. These are promises to Israel. Now, this is not, you know, plan A, plan B. God knew what was going to happen. He, he was, uh, he's establishing uh, things in order to, you know, uh, take away all arguments of men where people in our day say, well, I would, I would believe God. I would worship God. I would serve God if he made himself, you know, more known to me, if he would speak to me, if he would, uh, you know, answer my prayers, if he wouldn't be so silent. Well, he wasn't silent with Israel. I mean, he had visual evidence of him. I mean, he, he man, had justice upon his enemies he had the 10 plagues. They walked across the Red Sea down there at Nueva and got to the other side over on Mount Sinai in uh, Saudi Arabia. He got over there. And uh, man, and then they got the quail and then, and then they have the water out of the rock. I mean, they had God's visual proof all over the place. And, and, and of course, you know, they, they followed God without complaint, right? Right? Huh? Right? No. No, God had that set up because he wanted to show man that uh, even if I walked and talked with you like I did, Adam, your free will is uh, wanting to go against me. Mm-hmm, yeah. And when you do, uh, when you mess up like Adam did, I am the mediator. Yes, I, I got something. I got, I'll take care of you. I got to figure it out. You see, so he says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, that's the one at Mount Sinai. God knew it was faultless, or it was not faultless at the time. He knew it had a problem with it, but he's just kind of, he's kind of setting things up. Then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay, so the second. Now, he used the word covenant here, not testament. He used the word covenant. Okay, and then he says, finding fault with them, he saith, with them, finding fault with who? With Israel, where Israel had all the visible proof of God, and God was not silent, God was fair, and what did they do? Yeah, yeah, they turned their back on God, they provoked him. Yeah, that's back in Hebrews 3. The Lord found fault 
not with his covenant, but with them, Israel. He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And let's go check out this footnote. Okay? Behold, the days come. What is that? What is that? Okay, so that's, that. you see, that's where this is written, Jeremiah 31. And so if we go back and forth, I'm going to pull up this other one. Okay, so here we, he, he saith, finding fault with them, he saith. Okay, actually, you know, it's the Lord saith, speaking through Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the one that wrote it, and so right there is where it's found. Jeremiah 31, 31, 34. He saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Notice. Israel, Judah, not Jewish Christians, not the church, not British Israelites. So in a footnote, here's what I write. The new covenant is between the Lord and the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Boy, we got a deal breaker. We got a deal breaker here. Uh, what kind of person are you going to be? Are you going to be the one who wants to validate what you believe, seeking to justify what you already believe? It's Jewish Christians. It's Jewish Christians. No, it's not. It is not Jewish Christians. It is not a new covenant with Arabs or British Israelites, you know, the Aryans. No, it's not with them, British Israelites. It's not with Christians, not with the church, not the elect. Well, sort of, kind of. I italicize that because sort of, kind of, the elect. Uh, if you know what the real definition for elect is, not the Israel of God that... Uh, Paul mentioned, not spiritual Jews, not Mormons, not, not the feline fanatics, you know, cat, holics, feline, fanatic. This new covenant will occur at the national resurrection of the nation of Israel in the millennium. And there's the references. Now, there's more references. This is the most important doctrine of the Bible. So let's go back and forth forth with uh, the original in the Old Testament and see that the New Testament translation doesn't quite match the original, but God can do as he wishes. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Okay, so Jeremiah wrote, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, the Jewish fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand, bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant <laughs> they break. And although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Okay, so not according to that one. Back to this one. So he says, uh, let me see, where was I? Not according to the covenant. Okay. That's the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day. So there's where the covenant was made, Exodus 24, 6 through 8. The blood of the covenant, the Mosaic covenant. In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Boy, oh boy, he didn't. Yeah, there's where, there's where he made. Jeremiah 3, 8 is where he divorced. He mentions the divorce of Israel, and he's getting ready to divorce Israel. Uh, Judah, Isaiah 50, verse 1, is where he divorced uh, Israel. He said they were my wife. You see, he didn't mention that in Hebrews about that. Let's go back over here in Jeremiah, what he says over here in Jeremiah. Look at there, where he said, uh, I was an husband unto them. He didn't say that in Hebrews. I was an husband unto them. But Isaiah 50, verse 1, God divorced them. My friend, uh, maybe, maybe you've gone through an unfortunate divorce. And it doesn't always take two to tangle there because you're not, I'm, I, if you're going to tell me God's at fault in this divorce, uh, I, I am going to tell you, you am incorrect. You be wrong, man. You be off. You be out of here. No, God divorced Israel, Isaiah 50 verse 1. Sometimes un divorces are very unsettling. And it's a shame, but God understands. God understands. So back here. In, in Hebrews 8, then he says, For this is a covenant that I will make uh, with the house of Israel after those days. After the, what days? Well, we keep reading. We figure it out. Say it the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, 
and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. See, now he said something like this uh, also uh, in, in to Corinth, but this is something a little bit different. I know God's laws is written in our conscience, but this is a little bit different here, what we're dealing with. Let's go back to Jeremiah and see what he has to say on that. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be to their God, and they shall be my people. And now here's where you really get it. And they shall teach no man, no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them, even unto the greatest, say the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Who is there? That's Israel. That's Israel. See, and then Hebrews Okay, for this is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts. I did that already. And they shall not teach everyone his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Okay, now let's go over to the footnote. Check it out. Now here, boy, look at there. We got the verse comes right up. Jeremiah 50, verse, In those days and in that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Now here we go, Daniel's 70th week. Now a lot of people are confused on this, but it's so easy if you believe the words. It's so easy. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Thy people Israel, holy city Jerusalem. Seven characteristics to finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, you could, you know, you could say the first three uh, were finished at Calvary. Yeah, we can, we would go with that. We'd go with that. But everlasting righteousness, no. Seal up the vision and prophecy, no. Anoint the most holy. Well, he was sort of kind of anointed at uh, the triumphal entry, but he was riding a mule or donkey. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a, you know, an anointed prince. Uh, he rides a white horse in Revelation 19. Now, these 70 weeks, oh man, 70 weeks. Uh, that's, when those are complete, Israel's sins are forgiven as a nation. Hasn't taken place. Hasn't taken place. Romans 11.25. Well, let's take a look at this one. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. Oh, where'd it go? Okay, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this ministry. So this is one of seven major mysteries in the New Testament, and it is another topic that Paul doesn't want us to ignore. So it's a doubly important Lest you should be wise in your own conceit. So if a person ignores this, uh, like a British Israelite, they will be conceited. And Proverbs says that, seest thou man wise in his own conceit, there's more hope of a fool. And this is that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Okay, what Israel is that? Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Oh boy, yes, we're waiting for that to happen. Fullness of the Gentiles, that would maybe Revelation 11, it may be uh, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. So what Israel, if you're going to claim uh, Hebrews is for Israel, and I'm an Israelite, uh, what Israel are you? Verse 25, blindness in part, or 26, Israel that shall be saved. Which one? If you're going to say both, uh, you got a problem. And so all Israel shall be saved. That's not meaning that every Jewish person, because Paul already mentioned a remnant in chapter 9. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away all ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I shall take away their sins. That's what I should have did before. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. 
Now here, as concerning the gospel, that's gospel of Christ, today, they are enemies for your sakes. So they are blind in part, that's Israel. They are enemies to the gospel today. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So the election, the elect is referring to Israel right there. Yeah, all Israel shall be saved. Oh boy, why ain't that something? So then I got a footnote, let's check it out. Ignorance of the temporary blindness of Israel can cause confusion about the, con the covenants of Abraham, Moses, and David. This ignorance is the reason for the conflicts in the Middle East, anti-Semiticism, and the doctrinal confusion of British Israelite. But there is a difference between apostate Jews of the international banking cartel and a Jewish remnant who received the millennial promises of Abraham. Yes, there is a difference. Because these apostate Jews, or fake Jews, as Revelation 2.9, and unfortunately believers don't pick up on that, and a Jewish remnant are two separate uh, groups of people. Okay, back in Hebrews 8, here we go. So let's go back to this. Okay, let's check this out. That's, that's back there in Jeremiah. We already covered that. Okay, we uh, covered that. Teach. They shall not teach every man his neighbor. Why? Because Isaiah and Hosea prophesied of a time where the knowledge of the Lord will be as the waters cover the seas. So here in Isaiah 11, verse 9, okay, and uh, this one says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. And it's a time where a child can have a real teddy bear and a real cow and a bear shall feed together. Millennium! For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay, here it is in Habakkuk. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. That's the millennial time period. In Zechariah 13.3, it reveals that time period. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and a father of his a mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. The reason why is no need for that anymore. Everybody will know the Lord. Everybody on the earth, from sea to shiny sea. <laughs> Everybody's going to know the Lord from one end of the earth clear unto the other. Yes, and that's what uh, this Hebrews is talking about. Okay, so Hebrews is talking about, and Isaiah 54, 3, 13. Okay, Isaiah 54, 13 reads, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Okay, this taught of the Lord, look at there, Isaiah 2, Jeremiah 31. I could have easily put Hebrews 8. I didn't put that in there. So Hebrews 8, verse 11, got that covered. Know the Lord. For all shall know me. See, I got those two right there. And they're going to be taught by the Lord. And then he says, For I will be merciful unto their unrighteousness. Boy, ain't that the truth. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's the promise to Israel. Now, a born-again believer, we get that promise because of Calvary and the new birth. But this new covenant, in that he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, Exodus 20, now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So my friend, Hebrews 8 is a deal breaker. Are you the kind of person who reads the Bible who wants to validate and try to hold people in bondage? Mr. Arminian, Mr. Uh, Pentecostal, Mr. Uh, born again and 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 again, again, again. Hebrews 6, going to try to force Hebrews 6 into your church because you want to hold people into bondage? 
Are you like the uh, Baptist, the fundamental Baptist? You know, tithing, 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 church attendant, church attendant, church attendant, church attendant. Or are you a person who wants the truth, allowing the scripture to speak for itself, to whom it is spoken? Hebrews 8 is so obvious. I am fully persuaded that this letter was written by Paul to the Hebrews of the last days during the tribulation time period, encouraging them to endure to the end, to be one of the remnant for the millennial kingdom.